thing that Master P said before he got off stage was, don't die tonight. Something in my mind told me don't get in the crowd due to the fact of what happened to me earlier that day, you know what I'm saying, with the whole Master P, you know, audience and whatnot. So look, Travis Scott about to perform, it's probably like 100,000 plus people, you know, everywhere, you know what I'm saying, just standing around in the barricades, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't as bad, but something told me don't stand in the barricade. I sat on the side, you see what I'm saying? I went all the way to like the end of the line, and I was like right there on the barricade, but I sat like, you know, like took a seat on it so I wouldn't be in the crowd like that. But I'm, I kid you, I kid y'all not, bro. As soon as Travis Scott started, like as soon as he started, like all the flame, the fly, the fire, and, like the, the phoenix and all, and then he popped out, started going crazy. And like, I'm telling you, as soon as he started going crazy, like the whole crowd started raging. Everybody just screaming, help, help, help. Mind you, I'm sitting on top of the fence. So I'm looking down on everybody and I'm seeing all this happening, you know what I'm saying? Just reaching and they crying. I'm trying to pull people out. So look, in the middle, it's a VIP section. Like different celebrities and people who pay like thousands of dollars to sit in the VIP section. I'm mind you, I'm pulling people out and I'm trying to pull them into that VIP section. That's where like people was pulling people in so they can breathe. So the people in the damn VIP section, they get mad to my wife, you pulling people over here in our section. I'm like, man, Bro, these people about to lose their lives, you know what I'm saying? So I pull out this one boy. This boy, he probably like 14 years old. This is a little bitty teenager, bro. This one lady, I kid you not, in the VIP session, literally put her hands on this boy and associate this boy and start hitting him. Like, then I tell y'all don't jump the fuck. So I end up screaming, like, who the fuck is you to tell somebody what they can do? Like, this ain't your mother. Don't nobody give a fuck about what fucking ticket you paid for. Like, these people need some help. So I'm helping people, I'm pulling people out. And like, it just felt like we was like literally like in, in hell, bro. Like, it felt like we was in a concert in hell. You couldn't breathe, you couldn't see. Like, just imagine all the people they're gonna find tonight who was in that crowd, who nobody could see, who nobody could hear, who passed out, and everybody was just trumpling on top of them the whole concert. Like, I'm thinking it's probably gonna be like at least 100 people who dead tonight. Like, I, I kid you not. Like, in the VIP section, it was so many bodies laid out. People was getting pulled out who was fainted. And the people were trying, the medics were trying to give them CPR. And they was flipping them over. And, like, they was literally turning them black and blue. Like, I never seen no, I never seen death in my f bro. Just by me alone, it was probably, like, 10 people laid out dead. And, like, once the medics tried to help them, they wasn't responding. They moved to the next person. It was nothing they could have do. Like, shit, like, this shit really me up and like really spooked me tonight like that was like some demonic shit. and what was so crazy like people were screaming help trying to tell Travis, Travis Scott it was like help the whole crowd was just going to help 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 and he just kept going bro it was like scary bro it was so demonic bro and mind you y'all see the type of music I make y'all see everything like you know like I've been so heavily influenced by Travis but like after tonight bro like God really showed me like you know like stay away from it, bro like not for you, because, like, he sacrificed so many people's lives tonight, like, for real. Like, so many people's lives are gone tonight because they want to go to fucking Travis Scott concert and have fun. You know, he influenced people to be raging and all. So many people broke in, and it was just chaos, bro. It was a living hell, bro. Imagine seeing all those dead bodies, and that was that was just by me. And it got so bad, I was sitting on top of the gate. I was pulling so many people in, and people, and people were just screaming, crying. Trying to ask for my help. I got so overwhelmed. I, I jumped down and I, I ran out and I left, bro. Like, it happened tonight. And a lot of people, they, you know, people like, watch tomorrow. Y'all gonna see it was no fucking joke. Like, this shit happened. So many people got injured. So many people died. That shit was so wicked. Like, it was so wicked, bro. Like, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, put nothing on Travis Scott and call him Illuminati, that call him no devil worship. But that was, was, bro. We really went to a concert in hell, bro. You couldn't breathe. I'm talking about. Everybody was so crushed up on you. It was like literally no room for you to lift your chest up and breathe. Like you couldn't move. You couldn't do. It is definitely a shame, although not shocking, not one tiny bit, not even a little bit to see what happened at Travis's ritual sacrificial concert. Not shocking, not one bit, not even the tiniest smidgen. See, I could, <laughs> the rituals are so obvious at this point. 
I can certainly break them down, but death seems to be contagious these days in making the rounds, and I'm not trying to catch it. So I'm going to mind my business. <laughs> One person that I encourage you to look up if you're new to this is John Todd. John Wayne Todd. He used to be an occultist and he was in the industry and he breaks down very well how these rituals work, especially on the music side. Um, what do you think an MC is? A master of ceremonies. Ceremonies? Like rituals? Mm. Like the ones they do in the upper rooms with the blood and the records and the satanic prayers that they put out before. Look them up. Look them up. November 5th. Okay. 309 days into the year. Mm-hmm. Okay. 56 days remaining. All right. Oh, the gunpowder plot. Guy Fox Day. Oh, coincidental. Okay. I didn't say anything the first time I seen the sicko mode tent, but it definitely came to mind with um, Bosch because his painting is what? The harrowing of hell. I've made a picture to put a side by side in case you guys aren't familiar. Here it is. I'm very glad that that nurse was there to help out, but I'm not shocked. No, no, not shocked that they used her. Why? She's 23, the scapegoat number. She just graduated her college and became a, a nurse, um, an ER nurse, I think it was. And she's a fucking model. Go figure. I've added some of those pictures too. She got pictures with guns. She's got pictures with um, snakes. Real charmer. <laughs> Real charmer. Now, I'm not taking away from the good that she did because she was definitely very helpful in saving some, hopefully, lives. Souls, I don't know, but maybe lives. But she is still... Watch her come up now. Just watch. The rituals are so obvious. Fuck. As the timer got closer to zero, it got really, really bad. Um, I was trying, I couldn't even turn my head to tell my boyfriend anything. I mean, we were packed in there, so I had people shoving me from behind, shoving me from the front, on both sides. It's getting really hard to breathe. Um, I was trying to, like, jump up and lift my head up so I could get air. And uh, whenever he started performing, I looked at my boyfriend. I tried to look at my boyfriend. I only got about this far. And I told him, I said... I, we have to get out. We have to get out. And he said we can't because we couldn't. We couldn't move. We could not. You couldn't go forward, backwards, inside. You couldn't do anything. The only way to go was up. Um, I, I remember I was about to tell my boyfriend to tell my son that I loved him because as it went on, it got to the point where I was like, I'm going to die. Like, I really, truly thought that I was going to get crushed to the point where my trachea was going to get crushed my chest I thought I was going to die so I painted I think it was I don't even I don't remember what song was playing I don't remember anything I just know that he had just started and I uh, I fainted and her my boyfriend and a gentleman that reached out to me on Instagram and said he helped my boyfriend I um they basically crowd surfed my unconscious body um four feet to the right to a security guard because after trying to get the from my boyfriend he said that he tried to get your attention and you just couldn't because they were carrying so many people over that finally him and a just good Samaritan that happened to be there lifted me up and I they just crowd surfed my unconscious body over to the security guard I came to for a little bit and I was sitting and the fence was behind me with the crowd and I was in that little walkway area and I looked up and I just I passed out again and then when I woke up again, I was in a different part. I was in like the VIP area and I woke up with a bottle of water in my lap. Essentially what had happened was the security card dropped me off, sat down, and then went and ran back to get more people in and out.
Um, so once I, I sat there for a minute, I drank my water, looked around, there were people being carried back and forth. Um, and then I, I stood up and I was about to go, you know, look for my boyfriend. I had no phone service. I tried to call him. I couldn't call him. Um, I look and they're carrying this, this guy out and they're about to set him down. And I noticed he looked really bad. His eyes were rolled in the back of his head. He was completely limp. He did not look good. Um, I asked the security guard, I said, have you checked the pulse on this man? He said, I don't know how to do that. He's like, please help. So I, I checked the pulse. I did not feel a pulse. His eyes were rolled in the back of his head. His pupils weren't reacting. I shined my flashlight in there. Uh, I said, do not drop him off here to go get someone else. You need to go take this man to the medical tent. Take him somewhere. Go. I cleared the way. Another security guard overheard me say, because at first, before I told him that, let me rewind. I told him, I was like, I'm an ICU nurse. And then we have Drake. Drake with his shirt on, that cute little Baphomet on it. Oh, yes, that didn't go unnoticed. Yes, the big Satan on your shirt. Say it again with your chest. Baphomet. <laughs> All right. Well. See, even the dog is like, what the fuck? It felt demonic and satanic as fuck. And, like, I, I'm wearing a cross right now, but, like, I'm not even fucking religious, like, 0%, like, whatsoever. It just felt so fucking weird. I've gone to multiple concerts, and I've never felt the, like, way I felt watching him as I have other artists. Watching says that I felt fine, I felt happy, but when I was, like, waiting for Travis and watching Travis, it just felt, like, really, like, like, eerie, like, doomful, like, just odd. So, in the video I'm about to show, this is when Travis first came on, and he first came on with Eight Flames. The first headline that was released that people died was eight people. Eight people lost their lives. Hexamodesimal. We could break that down into binary code too. What is that? Zero, 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 one, zero, 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 or something like that. I forget. But it represents also an Ouroboros, which back in the Egyptian days would be the solar disk and the return back to what? The netherworld? Mm hmm. Because what was the netherworld? A funerary tale. A tale of mourning, death, star, mourning star, Aldebaran ritual. Anyway, that's Lucifer. You know him. He's an asshole. Don't follow him. He sucks. I've worked in the ED before. I have experience with this. Like, let me help. Instead of just trying to shove through me. The other security guard had overheard me tell the man that, tell the security guard that. So I, he, he came to me, he said, hey, we need your help up here. So he took me to the front of the, I guess I was in, I think I was in the VIP area. There were two towers beside me that people were standing on and also where the, the light crew was on either side. And um, I, I walk up and I mean, nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. Nothing. I mean, I, I worked. In the ICU, I see people die every week. I, when I was working in the ER, that's we get people coming to us that are, you know, have are CPRs in progress all the time. Things I find interesting. First, his Supreme Letterman jacket. So the games, let the games begin, right? Because Letterman jackets were started back in Harvard when they would wear the big H. You know, like them good old boys. I don't mean that I think they're good old boys, but you know them weaving spiders and owls and all that shit. So when I look at this next, what do we have? Like I was saying before, sex beta kitten. Because these women are only good for continuing the bloodlines and having babies or promoting brand products or being used as a sex slave of some sort. Those are their uses. 
So that's why she's pregnant. She's showing her sex beta kitten. She has Stormy, so you could expect some natural disasters to be coming up because there's a nude baby now also coming in. You could just see the rituals. It's very sad. It really is. Whether they're aware of it or not. I couldn't help but notice the similarities between Pan's Labyrinth with the Pale Man. The Pale Man was the one at the dinner table where the girl was there and she was told not to eat any of the food, and she did. Um, so let's just glance. I don't want to read the whole thing of the plot, but part of it. In a fairy tale, Princess Moana, whose father is the king of the underworld, visits the human world where the sunlight blinds her and erases her memory. She becomes mortal and eventually dies. The king believes that eventually her spirit will return to the underworld, so he builds labyrinths which act as portals around the world in preparation for her return. Then she has to complete these tasks. She comes across this fawn who is actually Baal. Ophelia completes the first task, retrieving a key from the belly of a giant toad, but becomes worried about her mother, whose condition is worsening. The fawn gives Ophelia a mandrake root, instructing her to keep it under Carmen's bed in a bowl of milk and regularly supply it with blood, which seems to erase Carmen's illness. Accompanied by, <laughs> Accompanied by three fairy guides and equipped with a piece of magic chalk, you know, it's interesting because um, Travis had a fairy-looking-like creature on one of his flyers, too. Ophelia then completes the second task, retrieving a dagger from the lair of the Pale Man, a child-eating monster. Although warned not to consume anything there, she eats two grapes, awakening the Pale Man. He devours two of the fairies and chases Ophelia, but she manages to escape. Infuriated by her disobedience, the fawn refuses to give Ophelia the third task. She becomes um, aware of his ruthlessness, and in the course of hunting down the rebels, blah, 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 skip, 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 skip. Um, Mercedes, having been discovered to be a spy, tries to escape with Ophelia, but they are caught. Ophelia, mistaken as a traitor, is locked in a room while Mercedes is taken to be interrogated and tortured. Mercedes frees herself, stabs Vidal, and rejoins the rebels. The fawn, having changed his mind about giving Ophelia a chance to perform the third task, returns and tells her to bring her newborn brother into the labyrinth to complete it. Ophelia successfully retrieves the baby and flees into the labyrinth. Vidal pursues her as the rebels launch an attack on the outpost. Ophelia meets the fawn in the center of the labyrinth. The fawn suggests drawing a small amount of blood from the baby to complete the third task, which would then open the portal to the underworld because it required the blood of an innocent. But Ophelia refuses to harm her brother, and Vidal finds her talking to the fawn whom he cannot see. The fawn, because it's a spirit, it's a demon. The fawn leaves, and Vidal takes the baby from Ophelia's arms before shooting her. Vidal returns to the labyrinth entrance where he is surrounded by rebels, including Mercedes and Pedro. Knowing that he will be killed, he hands the baby to Mercedes and asks, I just lost my place when that came up, and asks that she tell her son the exact time of his death. Mercedes refuses, giving him that his son will not even know his name. Pedro is then shot and Vidal is dead. If we skip to the end, Mercedes enters the labyrinth and comforts a motionless but breathing Ophelia. Drops of Ophelia's blood fall down the center of the spiral stone staircase onto an altar. Ophelia, well-dressed and uninjured, then appears in the golden throne room. The king of the underworld tells her that by choosing to spill her own blood rather than that of an innocent, she passed the final test. The fawn praises Ophelia for her choice, addressing her once more as your highness. The queen of the underworld, her mother, invites Ophelia to sit down next to her father and rule at his side. Back in the stone labyrinth, Ophelia smiles as she dies in Mercedes' arms. 
The epilogue completes the final tale of Princess Moana, stating she returned to the underworld, ruled wisely for many centuries, and left quite traces of her time in the human realm, visible only to those who know where to look. Oh! <laughs>